Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to King's College. Um, my name is David Edgerton. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this lecture to mark the inauguration of the Sir Michael Howard Centre for the History of War. And we're delighted that Sir Michael is here with us uh, this evening. In the 1960s, Michael Howard had a vision for a new kind of history of war, which would both study war in all its complexity and seek also to examine how war affected history more generally. He founded the Department of War Studies here at King's and later went on to become the Regis Professor of Modern History at the University of Oxford and after that, uh, the Robert A. Lovett Professor of Military and Naval History at Yale. Now, the study of the history of war has flourished at King's uh, in the years since his departure, vindicating his great ambitions for the subject. Today, King's has more historians studying war than any other comparable institution, not only in the Department of War Studies, but the Departments of History, the Defense Studies, and many others, notably, for example, the Department of English. And in honor of Sir Michael, and to make more visible and strengthen this remarkable concentration of effort and talent, the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War has been established jointly under the Department of War Studies and the Department of History. Our aim is to promote the scholarly history of war in all its dimensions, to train research students, to host research projects and conferences. And we also already run a flourishing masters in the history of war. Our aim is to promote the study of, war, of the history of war from the ancient world to the present. And we cover the history not just of all the armed services, but also of all those involved in war, all who suffered from it indeed. And we aim to study the history of war from many historiographical vantage points, from economic history to cultural history, from international history to the history of science and technology. We aim to encourage the study of the history of war as a central feature of human history and to study it from uh, using the work of historians of many traditions and from many uh, fields. And we do this um, in recognition of Sir Michael Howard's great contribution to the multifaceted history of war. Now, it's my great pleasure to hand over to uh, Joe Maiola, Professor Joe Maiola of the Department of War Studies, who will introduce our, our speaker. Joe. Thank you, David. Well, first of all, it, it, it falls to me to thank uh, uh, Richard O'Brien for accepting our invitation to speak tonight. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, and to give you a brief introduction to his career, uh, Richard was educated at Cambridge University and taught at Cambridge as a fellow of Queen's College from 1972 to 79. Um, in 1980, and this is his connection uh, both with uh, Sir Michael Howard and King's. He moved to King's College, the Department of History, uh, in 1980 and um, taught there uh, until 2004, at which time he moved to Exeter and took up uh, a professorship in modern history uh, at Exeter. He's a fellow of King's College, a fellow of um, the British Academy, the author of uh, 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 26 books uh, covering uh, the Nazi economy, the Second World War, air warfare, uh, 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 a vast impressive range of history. And for his contribution to the history of war, he was awarded by the Society for Military History, uh, the Samuel Elliott, Elliott Morrison Prize in 2001. Um, it's, uh, I, I'd also like to note that in 2004, he won the Wolfson Prize for history uh, for his book, The Dictators, um, Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia. In 2013, he published his latest uh, 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 book on air warfare, The Bombing, of, uh, the Bombing War, Europe, 1939 uh, to 1945. And he's just published two new books, A History of War and 100 Battles. And um, in a few weeks, his new book, The Oxford Illustrated History of World War II, uh, will appear in print. So uh, again, thank you, Richard, for accepting uh, our invitation to lecture. And uh, lectern's yours. Well, thank you very much for those uh, kind words of, uh, of introduction. 
Um, I want to start off by saying what a pleasure it is for me to be back in King's, having taught here for 25 years. It seems quite strange coming back here and not being responsible for any teaching. Uh, it's a pleasure to see some former colleagues, too, uh, in the audience. Um, I would also like to say, of course, what an honour it is for me to be asked to give this opening lecture uh, for the new Michael Howard Centre. I have to say that I arrived at King's in 1980, quite a long time after Michael had left, but he won't mind me saying that his presence lingered on in the department. Um, and indeed, we're all enormously grateful to Michael, I was particularly, uh, because it did make the history of war suddenly academically and historically respectable, um, which it wasn't, I think, in many uh, areas beforehand. And I certainly won't be the only person in in this room who uh, has tried over the course of his career uh, to uh, emulate the kind of things that Michael did in his. But I want to start off, first of all, by saying that my reasons for choosing this title when I was given the freedom to choose my title uh, it is largely a selfish one, because I am writing a history of the Second World War. Uh, it's in its early stages, and so daunted have I been by the prospect of condensing the Second World War down into one volume, that I thought I would take the opportunity to speculate a little bit about the problems of approaching the history of the Second World War. Uh, so I hope that you will indulge my selfishness in the course of the next hour. I want to start off just by reminding ourselves of what an extraordinary war we are talking about. If we look at it in aggregate terms, uh, it was an, a war waged on an enormous scale. More than 100 million people, mostly men, but some women, in uniform worldwide. 55 to 60 million dead, still, I think, our best estimate of the number of dead as a result of the Second World War. But tens of millions more, of course, damaged physically and psychologically by the experience. And aspects of the war, I have to say, which I think we underplay a great deal. Casualties are not just those who end up dead on the battlefield. There are many other kinds of casualty that one can count in the Second World War. Even more extraordinary, most of the combatant powers, except the United States, uh, devoted around about two-thirds of their GNP to the waging of war. That's an extraordinary figure. You think of the fuss people make now about 1% of GNP here and there. To think of countries willing for five or six years to devote up to two-thirds of their GNP to the waging of war. And then we need to remember, of course, the civilian cost. Uh, the tens of millions dispossessed, deported, uh, whose wealth and income uh, was squandered people who starved to death or died of mass epidemics, those who died under the bombing, and those, of course, who were the victims of violent racism. What an extraordinary conflict it was. So how do we approach it if our job is to write a history of the Second World War? Well, I would say that the recent tendency in much of the historiography uh, has been to what I call simplification or reductive narratives of the war. You can get reductive narratives of a number of different kinds. One, of course, is that the war and everything associated with it, in the end, derives from Hitler. Hitler is our central reference point if we want to understand uh, why war happened and the course of the war. Well, whatever one thinks about the role of indi uh, great individuals in history, this is clearly an inadequate explanation, um, not only because it's intensely Eurocentric. And then there are histories of the war simply as military conflict. There's a growing tendency, really, to treat this rather like the Premier League, um, rating states for their capacity to wage war uh, effectively producing the tables of performance, uh, which alter over time as people find good things to say about the Italians or good things to say about the British Army. And then there is war 
as a simple ideological battlefield. This is perhaps the most persistent, and I can understand it, persistent reductive narrative, that this is, in fact, the war of good versus evil. Complicated in a way, of course, because you have to sidestep the fact that uh, Britain and the United States were fighting side by side with the Soviet Union, uh, and since 1990, of course, we now have no illusions about the nature of uh, the Soviet system uh, during the wartime period. Now, all of these are what we might regard as, uh, as tidy answers. Uh, and I won't embarrass, I hope, Michael too much by reminding him that he once wrote that almost all historians are tidy-minded. Well, maybe we are. But the problem about the Second World War, I think, is the extraordinary complexity of this conflict. And it does, I think, raise some potentially baffling issues for anybody who wants to write about it. Because it is really the history of everything over a period of six years. But a history which is absolutely packed with extraordinary drama. Now, I want to highlight, first of all, three of the issues which strike me as important about writing uh, the history of the war. The first is the issue of timing. Um, now, some recent history of the Second World War have begun on September the 1st, 1939, with no introduction or explanation, um, and end, of course, on August the 15th, 1945. Now, this is clearly not satisfactory. And indeed, uh, the chronology has become increasingly move forward and backwards for the Second World War to be able to make sense of everything that happened during the course of the conflict. Um, reluctant though some historians are, I think, to accept the idea of the Thirty Years' War, it, it is difficult to get away from the idea that we are looking at a rather discrete period of European history and Asian history, Thirty Years, uh, which is punctuated by periods of uh, intense violence. And I think anybody writing the history of the Second World War has got to accept the extent to which it's rooted in the experience of the First World War. Not least because many of the leaders and commanders, of course, in the Second World War uh, had fought in the First World War. Not just Hitler, Mussolini, uh, but most of the leading commanders as well had experienced the First World War and brought that experience with them to the 1930s and the 1940s. It's also important to push it forward beyond 1945 because although 1945 seemed at the time a kind of curtain that you drew down with all the horrible things behind it, looking forward to a bright new global future, uh, you can't draw that curtain down. A great deal of violence went on after 1945, and I'll come back to some of that in, in a moment. A great deal of violence went on after 1945. A great many unresolved issues from the war uh, were only resolved again with violence over the course of the decade that follows. In other words, a strict chronology of 1939, 1945, I would argue, doesn't work anymore. Uh, uh, and in some sense, it's quite misleading if we focus simply on that six-year period. Then there's the issue of space or area, if you like. Now, the war did touch the entire globe, as you will know. It touched it in all three dimensions, too, land, sea, and air. In fact, I was often puzzled when, uh, as a child, I listened to my mother's stories about my family in the war. Uh, my mother was based in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, my uncle had a commission in uh, Antigua in the Caribbean. My other uncle was serving in the Pay Corps in Egypt. Uh, and I remember being puzzled about a war that Britain was fighting against Germany uh, in so many different parts of the globe. But it was global. People did find themselves fighting uh, in tiny corners of the war, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the globe, whether in Madagascar or the Aleutian Islands or wherever. Even neutrals, of course, were touched by the experience of war, often rather dramatically. For example, the Spanish Legion that went off uh, to fight on the Eastern Front, or in more surreptitious ways, Swiss bankers that were able to take gold melted down from murdered Jews and to put it into their vaults. But we tend to think, and I th you can see why, of course, of this as a European war in which the Asian war is in some sense a kind of appendix. Uh, and one of the things I found in, in contemplating 
writing about the Second World War, of course, is that we now have an extraordinarily rich literature uh, about the Middle East at war, about Southern Asia, about Eastern Asia, to make us realize, of course, that this was a war that affected all parts of the globe, but particularly the Middle East and Mediterranean, particularly South and East Asia. And indeed, it's impossible to write the history of the war without being able to write about these uh, diverse theaters and political systems. Third is the problem, I think, of definition. Well, the definition is a Second World War, thanks, of course, to Churchill, whose volumes, I think, are visible on the, uh, on the shelf behind me. Um, but, of course, it's many wars. Now, this was something that A.G.P. Taylor argued many years ago, of course, that you can't understand this simply as a war between Britain, France, and Germany, uh, but there are many wars. But he was thinking largely of international conflict, of regular wars. I, I think the important one of the important changes in the historiography of recent years has been to recognize that there are very different kinds of wars going on. There's war from below as well as, if you like, war from above. There's wars for liberation uh, as well as wars between states. And the work of people like Donny Gluckstein or Ernest Mandel um, has highlighted the extent to which if we leave out this war from below, we are missing a very important dimension of the conflict. I think we can distinguish perhaps three different kinds of war uh, going on uh, over the period that I've described. Wars between states, and these are, of course, the major military conflicts because only states can afford to wage war on that kind of scale. Wars between states either as aggressors or as defenders. Then civil wars. Civil wars like the civil war in Ukraine or in China or in Italy or in Greece or even Spain, in fact, which can be integrated, I think, into our larger story. And these civil wars really about the future system. What is the future system going to be? And then there are what I call civilian wars. These are the wars of self-defense. And the one that strikes me most, perhaps, is the organization of civil defense against bombing. Um, it, again, is something which we always think of as, as, as happening um, during the Blitz, etc., etc. But civil defense was worldwide. Everywhere you had to prepare for the prospect of being bombed. Uh, and civil defense required an extraordinary self-defense effort on the part of the civilian community. I've calculated that by 1941-42, there are uh, something like 30 million people in Europe enrolled in one form of civil defense or other. And then there's another kind of civilian war, which are wars of liberation. Now, these are wars of resistance. These are insurgencies. But they're not just insurgencies against the Axis occupiers, against the Japanese or the Germans. There are insurgencies, of course, uh, and civil movements against the British or the French uh, in their imperial possessions. The aim of these kind of civilian wars, of course, is liberation, liberation from empire, liberation from occupation. Now, these three wars are not the same, though, of course, they do clearly overlap a great deal, or even converge. In Yugoslavia, for example, the partisans, the resistance, um, their efforts converge with the efforts of the uh, regular war. Perhaps one good example is Italy. Uh, if you stop the clock at the moment, uh, at the end of the war in uh, northern Italy, you have an extraordinary mix of forces, an extraordinary mix of conflicts. There you've got the states war between uh, the Western Allies and the German occupiers. You've got the civil war uh, between fascist and non-fascist or anti-fascist Italians, you've got the civilian war, trying to cope with the uh, impact of bombing uh, and trying, of course, uh, to uh, accelerate the liberation of the Italian people. There are plenty of other different groups around in northern Italy um, at, the, at the end of the war, which again suggests uh, how confusing our history of the war is. I think perhaps of the Jewish Brigade 5,000 soldiers who were recruited from Palestine. The British refused to allow them to fight, but finally did relent at the end under American pressure. 
I mean, Jewish Brigade ended up on the Italian front at the point of uh, German surrender, but busily hoarding away weapons and equipment so that they could be shipped or smuggled somehow to Palestine, where they would help with the insurgency against the British, uh, who they'd been fighting side by side with uh, in Italy. Well, I won't bore you with more details about the, the Po Valley uh, in 1945, but it's a good example, I think, of just how complex the various trajectories are which bring people together uh, in the Second World War. Now, what I want to do, and I want you to indulge me in this, I'm afraid, what I want to do for the rest of my lecture, really, is to explain how I, I, I want to configure the war. And it does seem to me that what we need uh, for the Second World War is a very broad historical framework, a contextualization to be able to make proper sense of the nature of the conflict and the reason the conflict broke out. Now, much of what I'm going to say is not, I think, particularly original, but um, it's important, I think, to be able to set that war in perhaps a rather unfamiliar context, and that's really what I'm intending to do um, this evening. Now, I see the Second World War as the last imperial war. What do I mean by that? It's the end of a very long period of European-led imperial expansion and its imitation, particularly its imitation by Japan, which was self-consciously modeled on the colonial practices of the European states. Now, if you see the Second World War as the last imperial war, and I, I, I'll make clearer, perhaps, in a moment what I mean by that. We have to start, I think, in the late 19th century. Now, this might seem a very long way back from the Second World War, but it is important to start in the 19th century to recognize the extent to which the forces which finally generated with the First and the Second World War uh, were already, in a sense, anticipated by an earlier history. Now, this is a period, of course, of the so-called new imperialism, when European states expanded to all those parts of the world they'd not yet been able to touch or to put uh, frontiers around. But it's also an extraordinary period of political and social transformation, of economic change, mass urbanization, and the growth of mass politics. And part of the, uh, one of the consequences of that process, of course, was the need to define the nation much more clearly. And indeed, there are some nations, uh, relatively new nations, Germany, Italy, uh, Meiji, Japan in particular, which were very sensitive to this issue of how to define what the nation meant. But for all nations, European nations, and for Japan during this period, empires came to be seen as a kind of extension of the new nationalism, helping to define the nation and its destiny, encouraging national competition, exporting what we call the civilizing mission, the creation of what Robert Gerwart has called the nation empire, which I think is quite a good term, really, to describe uh, this 19th century change. Now, the elite, military, social, commercial, needed to canalize and control these changes in some way and combat radical mass politics by emphasizing empire as beneficial. This is particularly true, of course, in new countries like Japan, Germany, and Italy, but also true of countries with established empires like Britain and France, or new imperialists like Belgium, all countries like the Netherlands. All of these countries began to put uh, frontier posts up around their uh, colonies and protectorates to define where their empire was, because again, this was seen in some sense as a way of defining the nation. It didn't necessarily work, of course. Empire during this period is much more muted in its public appeal than uh, in the case of the 1920s and 1930s. The process of globalization, of course, is still going on. Indeed, the possession of global empires by the British and the French, for example, uh, helped to accelerate that process. But the problem before 1914, of course, is the areas to colonize are running out. It's no accident that from the 1890s onwards, these powers began to look increasingly at China and the Middle East as the remaining soft areas where it might be possible uh, to build up some kind of empire. 
It's striking that most of the conflicts before 1914, the Boxer Rebellion, the South African War, the Russo-Japanese War, the almost war over the Moroccan crisis, the Italian-Turkish War, all of these suggested a range of unstable regional zones existing worldwide, partly as a result of new nationalism, partly as a result of new imperialism. One of the effects of that, of course, was to encourage uh, large military build-up. National competition meant you had to be able to protect your national and indeed your global interests uh, militarily. It's also striking, I think, during this period, uh, 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 how much the appeal of the Darwinian view of the world affected people's view of national competition and imperial rivalry. Biological metaphors were widely used before the First World War and then again in the 1920s and the 1930s, as if somehow other competition between the states mirrored uh, the competition in nature. The language of European, Japanese, even American engagement with the wider world reflected uh, this intellectual shift. Now, in 1914, as you know, there came general war. I'm not going to get into arguments about who started it and why, um, but it clearly is important to emphasize the extent to which this national and imperial competition fed into what ought to have been a rather different crisis in 1914. And indeed, the unraveling of the Balkans, the unraveling of the Middle East during the period before, immediately before 1914, certainly played a part in encouraging dynastic empires to try to defend their crumbling position. What we can say, I think, is that general conflict was fueled by imperial and national rivalry, distrust, the special role of the military, and so on. In other words, the things I've been describing as phenomena before 1914 fed into uh, the final crisis of the First World War. And of course, at the end of the war, the dynastic empires did indeed uh, all collapse, as many in Austria-Hungary had predicted. Now, 1918-19, the so-called peace settlement, confirmed the importance of empire for the winners, for Britain and France, for Japan and Asia, even Belgium, which got its share of German colonies. Uh, under the League of Nations mandate system, although it was a mandate to uh, prepare these countries for in these peoples for independence, uh, the um, map was soon coloured uh, in French and British and Belgian colours. The Middle East now became the centre point of imperial strategy, certainly for Britain, uh, and East Asia became a centre point of focus for Japan. Now, this was a strange phenomenon because, in fact, the war, or the end of war, had showed that empire posed many problems. Empire was not, of course, necessarily a source of strength. It could also be a source of crisis and weakness. Partly because precisely that nationalism, which had fueled uh, European rivalry before 1914, had been exported very quickly, of course, to colonial and empire areas uh, where uh, elites wanted the, uh, the chance to uh, develop independent states of their own. So in 1919, 1920, 1921, widespread violence and protest in India, in Korea, in Egypt, in China against uh, European domination, and so on and so on. Now, things calmed down in the 1920s, but actually throughout the interwar years, empire was something difficult to manage, not necessarily the great advantage uh, that it was presented as. And what seems to me to be important in the 1920s and 1930s is the illusion that empire mattered, that it was a way of defining your nationality, defining yourself as, in some sense, uh, superior, carrying out that civilizing mission, preparing the rest of the world uh, for uh, its own liberation. Now, the irony, of course, is that for most European populations, as the new history of uh, European imperialism has shown, uh, for most of the populations, empire actually wasn't particularly important. Uh, and most people in Europe didn't go to the empire, of course. Uh, to them, the empire was what they saw uh, in the cinema, what they read in picture books, uh, and so on and so on. The illusion that empire mattered was something uh, that governments managed to market much more effectively. Presenting empire as something which has reached its high point, 
was a real paradox because this was really the point of crisis for European empire. Now, Germany, Italy, and Japan, for different reasons, were resentful at the outcome of war and the peace settlement. Germany for obvious reasons, but Japan too, because Japan felt it was not being taken seriously and its colonial claims in East Asia ought to be taken, ought to be regarded uh, more benignly. And Italy too, because Italy had been promised territories in Europe which it didn't get as a result of the peace settlement. And it's quite striking that in all three countries, and we know this, I think, from a very rich vein of recent literature on uh, imperial discourse, in all three countries, there was a discourse, began before the First World War, but it, it became more pronounced in the 1920s, on ideas of empire, living space, new economic orders to replace the global order dominated by uh, the British and the Americans, um, national destiny, Hitler, Mussolini, and the Japanese leadership reflected this intellectual shift, but they didn't cause it. And it's important, I think, to recognize the extent to which ideas about empire, ideas about how to correct the economic or international imbalances, on how to project your uh, national destiny uh, externally. All of this intellectual shift that occurred really before Hitler came to power before the Japanese began their process of imperialism in the 1930s and so on. And I think it's very important to recognize the extent to which what the German historian Beate Kundras has called imperial fantasies flourished in the 1920s and 1930s and fed into the crisis that finally led to the outbreak of the Second World War. Now the problem for those people with dreams of empire, new empire, was that there were new forces, of course, abroad, much more cosmopolitan uh, and anti-colonial in outlook. Soviet communism, and specifically Leninism, of course, challenged the whole idea of empire uh, and national self-assertion, and instead suggested that the world should be divided into classes and that communism was the wave of the future. In the United States, and among progressive circles in Europe, there was strong hostility to colonialism and narrow nationalism. Now, this threat, if you like, to the idea that the nation is your key uh, source of identity explains perhaps the appeal of fascism in Italy and Germany uh, and the appeal of a kind of ultra-nationalism in Japan as well. Strengthening the nation, asserting racial identity, challenging the Marxist and liberal international threats, all of this was important to them if they were going to benefit at all from the idea of the nation empire. It's quite interesting, of course, that in Germany, as we know, it's not just something associated with national socialism. In Germany as well, of course, there was hostility for the Jews. Because the Jews, for, for ultra-nationalists in Germany, represented these twin threats. They represented both communism and capitalism. Paradoxical though it seems, it was possible for anti-Semites in Germany to see the Jew as a threat, whether it was the Jew from Moscow or the Jew from Wall Street or the city of London. What all these three countries shared during this period were what I might call new value systems. Hostility to uh, democratic liberalism as well as hostility uh, to communism. And this is the origin really of that profound ideological gulf which separated off the Axis aggressors during the Second World War uh, from their uh, enemies, both Soviet and Western. Now, I would not argue that war was inevitable as a result of the things that I've been talking about, uh, though not certainly surprising. The important thing, of course, is that the Great War created conditions for prolonged economic crisis in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, despite the efforts to buy this crisis off using American money in the 1920s, um, 
there emerged in the 1920s and even more sharply in the 1930s ideas of competing economic orders, maybe restoring the old liberal trading global order and financial order uh, was uh, bankrupt. Um, maybe a new economic order would be necessary. Uh, an economic order based on growing state control, a communist model, or a protectionist, imperialist, near but mercantilist model uh, in which you dominated a particular region, its markets and its resources. What these arguments represented, of course, uh, was a, a desire to fragment, in some sense, a global order which had been growing steadily over the course of the 19th and early 20th century. But from 1929 onwards, of course, this sense of national competition, the sense that there needed to be different economic orders, um, were in, was encouraged by the fact of the economic recession. It produced growing confrontation. It produced, so it was argued, a growing need for empire, for physical resources to control, some kind of uh, territorial area uh, where you could seek your resources uh, and develop new markets. From that point of view, I think 1929-32 is a real turning point in explaining uh, why the Thirty Years' War remained a Thirty Years' War. It seemed to confirm the need for a new economic order. Britain and France fell back increasingly on the empire as a kind of alibi in the 1930s, uh, while in Japan, in Italy, and in Germany, leaders, German leaders, even before Hitler, uh, drew lessons from the recession, that it might now be necessary to move to a new international order in which they could dominate their own territorial and resource area um, and impose uh, a harsh regime of protectionism or autarky, as it came to be known. Now, in Japan and Italy and Germany, if you were going to do that successfully in the 1930s, I would argue that three conditions were necessary. First of all, they had to do it while the West was weak. And the West was weak, not just in terms of its inability to defend its global empire, which was increasingly evident, but there was a kind of moral weakness too. I don't mean by this appeasement, but the problem for Britain and France, of course, um, was that it was difficult to deny others the opportunity for empire uh, if you had empire yourself. And indeed, if the Hall of Our Pact, uh, which was supposed to stitch up Ethiopia uh, for Italy uh, in 1935, is actually quite an honest acceptance on the part of British and French government um, that there's not much you can do to challenge other people's desire for empire uh, if your priority is maintaining your own. But there were other problems, too, which the three potential aggressors had to overcome. They had to make sure that they could do what they wanted to do before international communism became too strong. And it's very interesting to look at um, a quite famous document from the Third Reich, the so-called four-year plan memorandum, which was almost the only document that Hitler wrote himself during the whole course of the Third Reich. In August 1936, he penned this long memorandum about Germany's strategic future. And in that memorandum, he makes it clear uh, that at some point, probably in the next 10, maybe even 15 years, the Soviet Union will be too strong for Germany to be able to do what it wants to do in Central or Eastern Europe. And that the moment to act has got to be now. Well, he says now, it's in fact four years' time, five years' time perhaps. Uh, but before the Soviet Union becomes too strong. The same factor, of course, would have influenced Japan, which was always forced during 1920s to look over its shoulder at what the Soviet Union uh, was doing. The third thing they had to consider, of course, uh, was embarking on these programs of imperial restructuring before the United States became committed to restoring some kind of liberal economic order or maintaining its own overseas security. In other words, all three powers thought that at some point in the 1930s there would be a window of opportunity that they could exploit uh, in order to be able to begin this program of territorial expansion and economic reconfiguration. 
Now, this was a dangerous path to embark on, and it's worth noting, I think, that all three of these states were opportunistic and cautious. They didn't rush uh, to set up territorial empire. Opportunistic, cautious, always pushing the door a little bit open to see whether it would open a little bit further. They also needed to overcome their own population's uncertainty about the possibility of war, uh, which they did, of course, by a vigorous propaganda campaign about saving the nation, um, uh, elevating uh, the nation's uh, I special identity. But it was a difficult kind of imperialism precisely because they were surrounded largely by sovereign states. This was not like going off and conquering some part of Central Africa or taking over uh, by force uh, some imperial possession in southern Asia. And it's quite striking, if you think about it, that all these programs of territorial expansion involved, in the case of Manchuria, i.e. China, uh, Ethiopia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, sovereign states, not only sovereign states, but sovereign states that were members of the League of Nations, so that expanding territorially in this sense, rather than trying to repeat what countries had done in the 19th century, seems, with the passage of time, increasingly fantastic or irrational. What did they think they were doing? The problem was that once they'd taken that first step, and the first step in the case of Japan, we might say, was Manchuria. First step in the case of Italy was Ethiopia. Uh, the first violent step, of course, really violent step for Germany, of course, was the invasion of Poland, but that was preceded by the occupation of Czechoslovakia. The problem is that once they had taken that first step, it was almost impossible to reverse. No Japanese government was going to say to the international community, oh, I'm terribly sorry we invaded Manchuria and we're going to pull our troops out. Um, nobody in Italy in 1936, 37, 38, would have said, oh, we're very sorry that we've occupied Ethiopia and we're going to withdraw. Now, I'm not being facetious here, but it does seem to me that what shapes the eventual conflicts of the Second World War in Asia, the Mediterranean, and in Europe are the fact that they burnt bridges in the 1930s, and it was very difficult to reverse that process once it had started. And indeed, the uh, occupation of Manchuria was soon followed by war in China. Uh, Italy's ambitions in Ethiopia are soon followed by ambitions elsewhere, Albania, then of course later on Greece. Uh, Germany's ambitions in Czechoslovakia are soon directed towards Poland uh, or uh, a sphere of influence in Southeast Europe. Step by step, once they'd taken that first step, step by step, they all moved towards constructing some kind of new order. Of course, we need to be aware it's not a new order at all. It's an old-fashioned, mercantilist, piratical uh, economics, um, a desire to simply seize resources uh, and labor power uh, and to create closed markets, as people did in the 17th or 18th century. And it's quite striking that in all three states I'm talking about uh, uh, that they adopted colonial practice almost immediately in Poland, in Ethiopia, uh, and then, of course, the Japanese and Manchuria. These were areas that were going to be colonized, areas where they were going to send Germans and Japanese settlers, where they were going to send two million Italian settlers to Ethiopia, and so on, and so on. Um, so irrational or fantastic that their ambitions seem, they saw it really as simply an extension of colonial practice, which went back 50, 60, 70 years. On the 27th of September 1940, the three states signed in a solemn ceremony in Berlin and a repeat ceremony in Tokyo, uh, the so-called Tripartite Pact. Historians have not paid much attention to the Tripartite Pact because they see it as a piece of rhetoric. Um, uh, but in fact, the Tripartite Pact is a very interesting document because it was a final statement after a decade of crisis and difficulty where these three states thought they'd almost done it. And they make a commitment to each other to support their efforts to construct three new orders, one in Europe, one in the Mediterranean in Africa, and one in East Asia. Now, what of Britain and France, the major imperial powers? 
Well, we all know, of course, from the history of the 1930s, that Britain and France were too troubled for much of this period to obstruct at first um, the ambitions of the three aggressor states. They suffered from a wide variety of problems, imperial overstretch, economic crisis, anti-war populations, strong anti-war feelings, strong anti-war movements in both Britain and France, uncertain of the Soviet threat, and it is very important to stress that. It wasn't just Germany or the Japanese, Germans or the Japanese were worried about the Soviet Union and the prospect of communism. It runs right through particularly British policy uh, in the 1930s. And there's one just small footnote, actually, which I think is an interesting footnote, that in 1936, when the Air Ministry began to plan the new generation of heavy bombers, uh, it was Harris's job, actually, to draw up the uh, memorandum to decide what kind of bomber they wanted. And the memorandum doesn't say we want a bomber that can f flatten Dresden and Hamburg, though that's eventually what he got. Uh, he says he wants a bomber that will be able to reach Soviet cities. He wants a bomber that will, first of all, be able to fly from Middle Eastern uh, bases to attack um, uh, targets in the Soviet Union, and hopefully to develop a heavy bomber in the 1940s, which would be able to fly direct from the United Kingdom to attack uh, targets in the Soviet Union. I put that in just a reminder, I think, in the 1930s, uh, that Britain, like uh, Hitler's Germany, shared this profound distrust of what the Soviet Union represented and the kind of threat that communism might pose to the survival of the empire. For Britain and France, there were too many regional crises, of course, to confront at once. They couldn't confront them all at once. In the end, they finally decided that Hitler was the greater threat of the three and they would confront him first. And they confronted him, as we all know, by creating a rather strange alliance, both in France and Britain, an alliance between imperial circles and elites who had a vested interest in sustaining the empire, hoping that the empire, in fact, would have a great deal of shelf life left in it, and a democratic population which could only really be mobilized for a second war in 1939 on the promise that this was a war to save civilization from the threat of fascism. Well, whatever the trajectory that brought people in to support the war in 1939, the effort was defeated everywhere in 1940 and 1942. Britain was not invaded and occupied, um, but by uh, the spring of 1942, uh, most of the Eastern Empire had been lost. Um, France had been defeated. Britain had been expelled from Europe. Uh, the outlook seemed bleak indeed, standing uh, at the signing ceremony of the tripartite pact, one might uh, think that the uh, Japanese, the Germans, and the Italians were not being overindulgent in thinking that their new orders might be realized. But of course, we know that they miscalculated. It was impossible in the end to leave the Soviet Union and the United States out of their calculations about how to build these fantasies of empire and to sustain them. Uh, in the real world. They were unrealistic geopolitically. That's why in the end, of course, um, Hitler decided on Barbarossa, invasion of the Soviet Union, which had a number of advantages from Hitler's point of view. It might help to defeat Britain. Um, it would carve out a large area of new empire in addition to what he already had in Eastern Europe. And of course, he'd be able to defeat uh, the communist Jewish enemy. Hence, too, Pearl Harbor. In the end, the Japanese, too, when they were calculating how they were going to be able to secure their domination of Eastern and Southeastern Asia, there didn't seem, in the end, any other solution but to try to give um, the United States uh, a bloody nose and prevent it from interfering in the process of empire building. And they kept fighting, of course, once that had happened. They kept fighting from fear of national extinction, real fear of national extinction, real fear that they'd bitten off more than they could chew in the end, uh, and that the international community uh, might, in fact, uh, find some way of dismembering them. They were defeated, of course, by what we might regard as an anti-empire allied coalition. But it's a strange anti-empire allied coalition because, of course, 
Uh, by the end of the war, it contained both Britain and France, both committed uh, to the re-establishment of imperial power uh, some way or other uh, after 1945. But in fact, 1945 did, I would argue, mark an important turning point. This did defeat the last drive, old-fashioned drive, for territorial empire. The United Nations and American power and Soviet power asserted that nation, not empire, would be the key unit geopolitically from 1945 onwards, and that the economy would be a global one and not a fractured imperial one. Empire was dismantled post-war. Indeed, what we have post-45 is the contraction of Europe to match the expansion of Europe uh, in the 19th century. Both Britain and France fought a long and losing battle. There were plenty of post-45 conflicts which related to the death throes of empire, Vietnam, Korea, Indonesia, Madagascar, Algeria, and so on. But in the end, the end for empire, I would argue, was inevitable. The Cold War and superpower dominance replaced it. Whether, of course, the United States and the Soviet Union exercised their own form of empire, is another story which I'm not going to become bogged down in. But victory was clearly, as we all know, ambiguous. Not for nothing uh, did Michael Howard, in fact, title this book of essays on the 20th century, Liberation or Catastrophe. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, a very few words, two, thank you, but I'd say in triplicate. First of all, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming, for making this such an agreeably crowded occasion, uh, and for asking, if I may say, for asking such intelligent questions. It all helps. Thank you, Richard. Richard and I have known one another for a long time, but I think this is the first time we have actually met on the soil where we learnt to teach history. Richard was here, well, I was here for 20 years, Richard for 25. Uh, and I think you will see both from Richard's performance and from mine that we did not waste our time when we were here at all. Um, I think I've read everything that you've read, written, Richard, and every single one is fresh, interesting, scholarly, provocative, and doing all the things which historians should do, which is increase one's knowledge and one's understanding. I think everything you've said in each of your books is new, fresh, provocative, practically Every book has sometimes infuriated me, always stimulated me, and I usually end by thinking, my, the man's right last year. <laughs> but it is so good to know that there is another one on the stocks, uh, which we will all look forward immensely to reading. Thirdly, thanks, obviously, to the founders of this center, to um, to, um, sorry, um, uh, to, to Professor Mile, to Professor Edgerton, I suspect to Professor Holden Reed, I suspect also Professor Theo Farrell, and I'm sure a number of other people who I don't know so much. Thank you for founding the center, for doing all the things which, as you have said, I have always been interested in and hoped would continue. Um, thank you even more for naming it after me. <laughs> I can't tell you how honored I am by this. I won't say that I'm speechless. It takes a great deal more than that to make me speechless. But it makes me very, very happy. Um, it was enough 
to have a Michael Howard room named after me. That made me feel important. Somewhere where I could, or my picture could, beam approvingly and encouragingly on all the people who are doing research there, and I will continue to do so indefinitely. Um, se um, secondly, to have my name up in lights in the Strand, together with those of such eminences as the Duke of Wellington and Desmond Tutu, has made me feel, how can I put it, historic. <laughs> but to have the center of military, the Michael Howard Center for the Study of War, has named after me, has made me feel, the only way I can say it, it's made me feel immortal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, we have a wine reception, uh, um, and it's all set up just outside in the main foyer here. So just one last round of applause for our speakers. Thank you so much, Richard.